Hello everyone! With probably the final update for Xenoblade 3 now out of the way, it seems that the long journey that began on July 29th, 2022 is finally over and the game is complete. I am super happy with the end product that we got and I think many other fans agree with that statement. Thanks to Future Redeemed we got a proper conclusion to the Cloud Saga and many answers that were left open during the base game. Now we can actually make a comprehensive timeline of events check my video out after this one if you want to, and also theorize about other open questions with clues that the games provided. That being said, a lot of open questions remain theories or just heavy speculation on our part because there's no concrete answer to be found. And then there are other questions with no real answers at all. What happened to our old friends? Who is Mithra's kid? So I decided it would be a great video idea to list some of my open questions that I really want answers to. The best part about this is that we still have a chance to get some of these answers and you even have a chance to get some of your questions answered. Because it was just announced that the official Xenoblade 3 art book will be released in April and will feature a section for fan questions. For more information stay tuned till the end. For now, let's get into my personal top 10 unanswered questions from Xenoblade 3. And don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more Xenoblade videos. Number 1. Let's start off with a banger. One of the most important questions for me. How did Nia become a queen? Not only was it pretty obvious that Melia was going to be a queen in Xenoblade 1, she even got a full epilogue dedicated to her with Future Connected, so it really came to no one's surprise that she is the Kavesi queen. But for Nia on the other hand it seems like this came out of nowhere. Well in Xenoblade 2 we actually learned that she was awakened as a blade in a royal household. Her driver was one of the seven lords that ruled over Gormoth once. Lord Etchel had a sickly daughter so he looked all around all rest to find a cure and that's when he awakened Nia. Nia and her sister had a few happy years but the tireless search for a cure didn't yield any results and her dad lost all his fortune which took a toll on his daughter before she died. It was then when Nia became a flesh eater so that the daughter could live on in her. But after this Nia became a drifter and ended up in our party. She never acted like a royal, nor did she ever act like she would be interested in becoming one. So how is it that she became the Queen of Agnes in Xenoblade 3? We even see her being the queen during the construction of Origin in the prior world. I really want to know and I do hope we get an answer sooner or later. If not in the art book, then maybe in Xenoblade 2 Definitive Edition with a near epilogue. You know what? I would actually prefer that. Number 2 Let's get this one out of the way as soon as we can. Everyone and their mom wants to know who Mithra's child is. We already saw Nia's kid Mio and Pyro's kid Glimmer in these games, but the lack of information on Mithra's kid has driven the community mad and created the cursed Dirk nation. And all of that because of a simple meme. If we don't get the answer in the art book, this meme will never die, so it is paramount that we get this information as soon as possible. Also there's this theory going around that Glimmer is both kids combined or whatever because she looks like Pyra but acts like Mithra but I don't buy into this theory. Kids are not exact copies of their parents and Mithra most definitely had an influence on all three children at one point. Also it would really make no sense to show that they both had different children to then fuse them into one new child. While we are at it, it would be amazing to know what happened to Pyra and Mithra after the collision. We have theories on why they turned back into Numa's core crystal but nothing really substantial. And how this core crystal ended up in Gondos and then Matthew's hands is also a mystery. Number 3. Let's stay on the topic of the collision for a second. Future Redeemed answered many of the lingering questions about how it all went down and why some people are in Zeth's cycle and some are not. We learned that most people died and were assimilated to Origin during the collision. These people can be used by Zed and put into his cycle after he gains control over Origin. But Rex, Shulk, Panacea, Linka, Nia, Melia and Riku are some of the few people of the old world that never were assimilated by Origin. 
This means that these people never lost their memories and Zed has no control over them. Also thanks to the stopped flow of time, they can now live for a much longer time than usual. This is how Riku and Melia can live for over 1000 years in Ionios as well. The problem is that we don't exactly know why they were not assimilated and Future Redeemed leaves this question open as well. We also don't fully understand how aging works for them. As I said, Riku survived for over 1000 years, but between the beginning cutscene of Future Redeem and then 15 years later, we see Shulk grew his hair out and looks visibly older as well. We also have no idea how many years he and Rex fought against Zed before Alpha appeared. It included multiple reincarnations of Noah and then extra 3 generations after Gondor until Alpha appeared. I guess I put multiple questions in here for one. Why were Rex, Shulk, Nia and Melia not assimilated to Origin? How many years passed in Ionios before Alpha appeared? And how does aging work for them in Ionios? Number 4. Let's talk about the Aegisus again. But this time it's about Malos. Why are people talking about Malos when we never saw him in the game and he also died during Xenoblade 2? Well, a scene in Future Redeemed heavily hints at Logos' core being insights and sort of the end. But if you want to know more, I've already made a video on this topic as well that covers everything, so check it out. TLDR, it is this scene where Rex talks to A about them and the camera suspiciously moves not only to Matthew's gauntlets that were already confirmed to have Numa's core crystal, it also shows Anne's sword glowing in purple. Plus he was able to fight on par against Ontos which also heavily hints that he has massive powers. Basically, Takahashi left us breadcrumbs for theories but we can only speculate what this all means until concrete confirmation. Maybe in the interview they could also explain how the core was able to be recreated which I also covered in the video. I definitely think that the Sword of the End and the Sword of Origin are both so powerful because of the Trinity core crystal buff that they have. This could also give us the opportunity to finally confirm that Noah carries Numa's core crystal inside his gauntlet. Number 5. What is Ionios really? Origin was a system we constructed to reboot the world's states. And then, the time was upon us. The reboot process failed to initiate. Instead, in that instant, the worlds became still. By the will of Mobius. I know this question might sound weird at first, but the more I talk about this with people, the more uncertain the answer becomes. The game explains the following events. The two worlds of Bionis and Alrest were about to collide and erase each other. But before they could overlap completely and before Origin could initiate the reconstruction, time was stopped by Zed. The annihilation events that occur all over Ionios are a small scale indication of what happens when the two worlds overlap and these events still keep happening in Ionios. This suggests that Ionios is just what remained of the old worlds. But if we dig deeper, we see that the game suggests that this is a world that Origin created. First it is said multiple times that Zed controls the fabric of this world. Nia mentions that controlling origin means controlling the world. But we can get even more concrete than that. Dana Desert is a Torna area that was already destroyed 500 years prior to Xenoblade 2. This area couldn't possibly still exist without origin somehow recreating it. Then there's the Meconesort and Galahad fortress that were also reconstructed in Ionios even though they were cut in half and destroyed during Xenoblade 1. These areas suggest that Ionis is not simply what's left of the world, but a different reality that Origin created with former memories. We still have no real answer to this mystery and I want to actually know what really happened during the collision. Number 6. Now let's move on from Future Redeemed and the beginning of Ionios and let's talk about the main game events that were left unexplained. Who is Mobius A? I think this is a fun question that still remains a mystery. Ever since the main game, we saw the whole alphabet of Mobius except A. People thought Future Redeem finally filled that gap, but A is not actually Mobius at all. After Alvis was split into two people by Gondor, 
A is split apart from Alpha and has all the former memories of Alvis. Now there is a chance that Z never used the letter A for his Mobius because he still respects and sees Alpha as his god, but that just remains a theory. There's also the cute theory that Ionios represents Console A, but this is even more speculation than the first one. It would be really nice to get confirmation. Also I really feel bad for the person that was given a name that starts with an A and wants to become Mobius, but Z won't let them. Number 7 oh, and Riku? What is? Mind if I change the name? Me? Lucky Seven just isn't doing it for me. <sighs> so, what name did you end up picking? Huh? Um, name. Uh huh. You don't want to say. Or what? Is it that embarrassing? N no, it's not embarrassing. That's not it. <laughs> I'm getting strong emotional vibes here. I wouldn't say emotional, per se. Rather, something I miss. Yeah. Believe it or not, we still got no confirmation of what name Noah chose for his sword. Yes, people. I know that there are cool theories out there. There's the theory that Noah named it Truth Singer because after you upgrade your weapon and look in the hero roster it says the name of the weapons for every character. There are multiple problems with this approach though. First the name only updates when you power up the sword, it was called the Veiled Sword before that. Then this also ignores that this description is talking about the whole sword, sheath and Lucky 7 combined while Noah only wanted to rename Lucky 7. Lastly, the other characters have also stupid names for their blades. Mios are called Sun Dancers, Tyons are called Spell Tags Totality and Alexandrias are called Exponential Edge for example. Did they also all rename their blades and was everyone else also bad at naming things? Also, Noah literally said that the name is neither embarrassing nor emotional. It's something from the past that he misses. How does Truth Singer fit this description? Number 8 Have you wished the now would last forever? Your two lives, thriving and persisting far beyond homecoming, surpassing the system of the world. I was fascinated even beguiled by you. Let's return to something more serious and important for the plot. With how the world of Ionios works, it has been explained that reaching homecoming means the soul will escape the cycle and can't be reborn again inside of Ionios. But N and M are the only exceptions. This even surprises Z and it's the reason he made them consoles. Not only that, Noah and Mio's spirits could still reappear in the cycle even after their former selves became N and M. And yet again, there are theories. Did Gondor's blast that split Alvis into two parts also do the same with N? Sounds like a neat theory as to why Noah reappeared after N was created, but still doesn't explain how he came back after a homecoming before becoming N in the first place. This also completely ignores that the same happened with Mio, even though M was nowhere near the blast. Long story short, we have no definitive answer as to why these two specifically have surpassed the system of the world. Number 9 There's a place doing just that. The city. The city is. The many lives born of the city. Lives whose existence was never recorded in origin. They are our future. They themselves are proof of the coming winds of change. What happens to the city people? The game gives conflicting answers to the topic if the city people are being assimilated to Origin or not. We know that Origin was created prior to Ionios, so every soul born in Ionios was never recorded inside Origin. This was brought up in the game as well. Then we have Gondor in the end also basically confirming that they are content with the chance of being reborn in this new world. And if that happened, she would hopefully want a better name. This strongly hints that the city people know that they can't be recreated by Origin and that they are okay with this. 
That was also why Alpha appeared and wanted to save the city people by the way. But then there's Shania. She literally transitions into becoming part of the cycle and then was also recreated by Origin. This means that there has to be a way to get saved onto Origin's database, but we don't really know what steps are involved in this. So if that's possible, what does that mean for the city people after Xenoblade 3 ends and the worlds are fused into one? Did Origin save and recreate the people again into this new world or not? And if it did, did it save every single soul from the city that has passed away in the past 1000 years that we know that canonically passed between the end of Future Redeemed and the main game or does it just recreate the people that were alive now? I am planning on releasing a video specifically to this topic very soon, so stay tuned. But for now, we have no real answer. And number 10. As you probably noticed, my list doesn't include many obvious questions people have about the future of Xenoblade. That's because I don't think Takahashi would ever answer things that are obviously left as teasers for the future. He won't answer if Cosmos is falling towards Earth, how Xenoblade X is connected or if the party ever meets again in the future because these are specifically set up as cliffhangers and teasers. But there's stuff happening at the end that he might be willing to answer because it creates even more of a mystery. After the credits of the game, we see that Origin rebooted the worlds as programmed, but this time they are combined into one single planet. It is here that we see that young Noah is back in his previous world and everything is reset. But after the boy hears flutes playing the Cavesian Agnian off seeing tune and runs towards it, we zoom away and birds fly by. But Noah suddenly disappears after one of these birds fly by. It is really hard to notice and not obvious at all, so I'm wondering if this was meant to be symbolic or if this really means he just teleported away. I don't know if Takashi would be willing to answer that, but I hope we get at least an answer if this was intentional or not. And what I would also love to know is how aging still works in this new world. A question we had before the game even released and then later dropped after the flame cycle was announced. How do Noah, Uni and Lance seemingly age at the same rate even though their races were known to age in vastly different ways? Makina can live up to thousands of years with the oldest one we know being Mikol at age 6000. And Hyantia live up to 400 years with Sorian being 320 years old. Also Tilan here is 43 years old and still looks like a child. So how is it that Noah, Uni and Lance even look the same age in the original Bionis at all? I hope we can get answers to that. With that I will stop my list here. I personally am more interested in lore and that's what my list was focused on. So I didn't include stuff like is Ashira related to Dunban, she definitely is by the way, or who is Riku's actual dad, Riki or Kino. As I said I also didn't include questions like is Cosmos falling towards the earth or how does Xenoblade X connect because I feel like they were meant to stay open for future exploration. But if you really want to get those answers or if you have even more questions that I didn't think about then first you can let me know in the comments but also don't fret because there is still a chance to get some of these answers. Right after this update dropped and we got our hands on the Noah and Mio amiibo, Monolith Soft announced a proper 400 plus page long artbook for Xenoblade 3 that is gonna release in April. And if you are watching this video before January 26th, you can even help us get some of these answers. Because Monolith Soft opened a survey for Xenoblade 3 that they will discuss in a roundtable discussion and include in the artbook release. This is on a Japanese website meant for the Japanese audience but anyone can participate. Just be aware that they could possibly ignore English questions so I would recommend trying to translate it into Japanese first. I will link this in the description so hurry up. If it's already too late, don't worry. I am sure the Xenoblade community has you covered and we will definitely get some of these questions answered in April when the artbook finally releases. So don't forget to subscribe so that you can see me cover everything that the book covers on this channel and even more Xenoblade videos. Also if you found this interesting, don't forget to leave a like. 
do Atefonia. 